So having spent the last part of this lecture looking at the real zeros of polynomials, there's sort of one natural place to look next, okay? And that is complex zeros of polynomials. We looked at complex numbers right at the beginning of the course, and it turns out they actually have a very, very interesting role um, in our study of uh, the zeros of polynomials, okay? And I'm gonna introduce uh, two theorems to you right off the bat, um, and then we're going to sort of look at what these complex zeros can do. The first one is a, is, is a big one, okay? It's called the fundamental theorem of algebra. And that word fundamental is a hint that this one is, of course, very important, okay? And it says that every polynomial and then we're gonna write out our polynomial. P of x is a n x to the n. And I guess I'll leave off all those middle ones because we've written that definition a lot, okay? And we have to say with n our degree greater than or equal to one, okay? Our leading term is not zero. And where the a sub i are complex coefficients. So every polynomial like this has at least has at least one complex zero. Okay. Now what I want to remind you of this, right, is every real number is a complex number, right? And not not every complex number is real, but that would mean that this theorem would apply to our polynomials as well. Okay. We're not going to prove this. Um, unfortunately, it takes some rather advanced mathematics to prove it, but we can absolutely um, use it quite a bit in our study of polynomials. If we use the fundamental theorem of algebra along with our factor theorem, we come up with, with one more theorem that I'm going to share with you, and that's the complete factorization theorem. Okay? And it goes like this. It says that if P of X is a polynomial of degree um, N greater than or equal to one, okay, then there exists complex numbers C1, C2, all the way up to Cn, okay? And sum A not equal to zero, where P of X is equal to A times X minus C1 times X minus C2 times dot, 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 X minus Cn, okay? And if you were seeking to do this right, you know, you might use our fundamental theorem of algebra and our factor theorem to factor out one of the zeros because it's always going to have at least one. And then you're left with a linear term, you know, one of these x minus c ones times another polynomial. And then you can just sort of continually repeat this process until you're left with just this expression here, okay? So we'll do some examples of this, right? Um, just based on the fact that we have a lot to cover um, today. Um, and I know the lectures of this week have been a little bit long. Um, I've actually pre-written these examples for you. Um, that way we don't need to necessarily uh, sit down and watch, right? Like while I'm reading it to you and, and writing it out, you can pause it um, and then just go ahead and write it down. So we have this polynomial right here, 
x cubed minus 3x squared plus x minus 3. We're being asked to find all the real zeros of p and then find the complete factorization. So I'm actually going to notice for part a that we can factor this guy by grouping. Right? We can write this as x squared times x minus 3 plus 1 times x minus 3. Right, so then we can simply factor out this x minus 3 to get x squared plus 1 and x minus 3. Okay, but this is not our, our complete factorization, nor does it give us all of our zeros. Right, we have our real zeros, well, only one, right, our, our one real zero is x equals 3. Okay, and then we have this term right here. If p of x is equal to 0, then either this term is 0 or this term is 0, right? We've already accounted for this term, so let's say that x squared minus 1, or x squared plus 1 equals 0, so we get x squared is minus 1, or x is plus or minus i. So those are our complex zeros. We have x equals plus or minus i, okay? And then from here, we can write down our, our part b, which is our complete factorization. p of x is x minus 3. And then we're going to have an x minus i and an x plus i, right? That's our completed factorization. And here's our next one. We have... The same sort of setup here for our part A and part B, but our polynomial is x cubed minus 2x plus 4. Okay, we're going to take a look at the rational roots theorem here. So let's write our possible zeros. Again, these are only the rational ones. We're going to have plus or minus 4, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 1. Okay. And we always seem to start with our positive entries, so let's take a look at starting with our negative entries this time, just to mix it up a little bit. Our coefficients are 1, 0, negative 2, and 4. Draw our lines. Looks like we get 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, and 5. So no luck there. Let's try negative 2. 1, 0, negative 2, 4. We got 1, negative 2, negative 2, 4, 2, negative 4, and 0. So we factor it out p just a little bit. So we have p of x is x plus 2 times it looks like x squared minus 2x plus 2, okay, feeding this into our quadratic formula, we're going to have that x is, looks like 2 plus or minus the square root of 4, minus 4 times 1 times 2, that comes out to 8, all over 2, which looks to me like that's going to come out to 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 4, or 2i all over 2, or 1 plus or minus i, okay? So now we have our zeros, right? We'll go over to red for that. We have x equals negative 2, and then we have 1 plus i and 1 minus i, and we can use these to write our complete factorization, okay? We have p of x is that x plus 2. We're going to have x minus 1 plus i and x minus 1 minus i. Right. Writing that just a little bit cleaner to get rid of those parentheses. x plus 2 times x minus 1 minus i times x minus 1 plus i. Okay. Up next, we're going to take another look um, at this idea of multiplicities of zeros. Okay, so zeros and their multiplicity. 
what can we do with that, right? If you remember, our complete factorization theorem says that we can get this list of C1 through Cn, right, that are all the zeros of our polynomial. And those don't have to be different, right? You, you could have some polynomial, say P of x is x minus 1 cubed times x plus 2 squared times x plus 3 to the fifth, right? This x minus 1 term, right, we have that x equals 1 is one of our zeros with a multiplicity of 3, right, coming from this cube here. This gives me that x plus x equals negative 2 is a 0 with multiplicity 2. And this one gives me that x equals negative 3 is a 0 with multiplicity 5. Okay. And if we count all of the um, multiplicities and their zeros, notice that that is the same as adding these powers, right? And, and that's something that we call the zeros theorem, okay? And the zeros theorem says this. It says every polynomial once again with degree n is greater than or equal to 1 has exactly Um, n zeros provided a zero with multiplicity k is counted k times, right? And this is the beauty of what these complex zeros allow us to do, right? you know, taking a look at, say, the polynomial x squared plus 1, right? If we have the polynomial x squared plus 1, well, we, we would really want that to have two zeros, right? Because it's a, well, we have a squared function. And, and, and we want to look at that and say, oh, x squared plus 1, my highest power is 2, I have two zeros. And that is true, assuming we're counting for multiplicity, but that's only true if we consider complex zeros as well, right? This, this function never crosses my x-axis, so there's no real zeros, but if you were to extend this function into the complex plane, well then you would get indeed your two zeros, okay? So let's do a nice little example of this, okay? We're trying to look for all five zeros of this polynomial right here. P of x is three x to the fifth, plus 24x squared, or cubed, plus 48x. So when you're looking for your five zeros, right, what you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to factor it, right, because factors and zeros give us one another, right? And the first thing that I notice when I'm looking at this is that we have an x in, in common amongst all of these, but also a factor of three, right? 24 is eight times three, and 48 is 16 times three, right? So we can pull out a 3x, and we get x to the fourth plus 8x squared plus 16, okay? This to me looks like we could use a little bit of u substitution given we have an x to the fourth and x squared and zero. So we can set u equal to x squared. This becomes 3x, the x can just stay for now, times u squared plus 8u, plus 16, but notice that that is a perfect square, right? That's the square of u plus 4, okay? Going back into our x world, we have 3x times x squared plus 4, right? So we're almost there, right? Uh, this should be squared, right? We're almost there, and we need to try and break apart this guy. So we can do that off in the corner, right? Say x squared plus four equals zero. 
So x squared equals negative 4, or x is plus or minus 2i. Okay. So we can break this apart even further into 3x times x minus 2i squared times x plus 2i squared, right? This is our complete factorization, and we can immediately read off our zeros of p. Since we're trying to find all of them, right, we need to list the ones with higher multiplicity multiple times, right? We have 2i from this one. We have another 2i from the fact that that factor is squared. Then we have minus 2i and minus 2i again for the same reason. For our next one, we're once again looking for all of the zeros of this polynomial. Okay. P of x is 3x to the fourth minus 2x cubed minus x squared minus 12x minus 4. Okay. Using our rational roots theorem, right, our possible zeros are our factors of 4, so plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, okay, divided by our factors of 3, right? So 1 is a factor of 3, which is where we get these, this group, and then each of those needs to be divided by 3, plus or minus 1 third, plus or minus 2 thirds, and plus or minus 4 thirds, not 4 fourths. In the interest of time, right, we did a lot of examples with this in the past, and you'll have some on your homework and in the coming weeks, but I'm going to tell you that we should start searching at 2 and at negative 1 third, okay? Starting with 2, 3, negative 2, negative 1, negative 12, and negative 4. And then we have 3 times 2 is 6, adding straight down for 4, times 2 is 8, adding straight down is 7, times 2 is 14, adding straight down is 2, multiplying by 2 is 4, and adding straight down is 0. Two things to notice here, okay, one, we found a factor right? It's reduced term being 3x cubed plus 4x squared plus 7x plus 2, barely fit it on there, right? Um, and, well, we also have that 2 as an upper bound for our zeros as all of these are positive, okay? But as I said, the next smart one to check would be 1 third. And we can just check it against these terms, right? 3, 4, 7, and 2. Dropping straight down, we get 3. That should be negative. So that comes out to negative 1 for a total of 3. Once again, coming out for a total of negative 1. 6, multiplying that becomes negative 2 and zero again, okay? So now we get that p of x becomes x minus two, x plus one third, times three x squared plus three x plus six, right? Using that same trick we used last time, I can pull a three out of each of these terms and then multiply it into this one to turn it into x minus 2 times 3x plus 1 times x squared plus x plus 2, okay? And then this looks to me like a perfect candidate for the quadratic formula. So our final two zeros come from x is equal to, it looks like negative 1 plus or minus 1 minus 4 times 2 all over 2, okay, which is going to come out to 1 plus or minus the square root of negative 7 over 2 
And we can't simplify the square root of 7, but we can pull out our square root of negative 1 to get i the square root of 7 over 2. Okay. Writing out our complete factorization, we have that p of x is x minus 2, 3x plus 1, and then x minus minus 1 plus i root 7 over 2, and then x minus negative 1 minus i times the square root of 7 over 2. So then that means that my zeros are as follows. 2 minus 1 third. And then for this last one, I do want to write it in standard form because we always want to write our complex numbers in standard form. So it comes out to negative 1 half plus or minus i times root 7 over 2. One more example before we move on to our next topic. So we're being asked to find a polynomial of degree 4 with some given zeros and a point. Okay. We can write our polynomial in, in factored form. right? So what? It's going to be x minus i, x plus i, x minus 2, and x plus 2. right? And we need some leading term a. right? We can multiply each of these pairs. right? Um, to get a x minus i times x plus i, it's going to come out to x squared plus 1, and x minus 2 times x plus 2, it's going to come out to x squared minus 4. Okay. And now we want to multiply these together. Looks like we're going to get x to the fourth, negative 4x four squared, and 1x squared comes out to minus 3x squared. And then 1 times negative 4 is negative 4. Okay. But now we need a value for our a. But here's what we know, right? We know that p of 3 equals 25. So we can write that 25 equals p of 3, which is a times 3 to the 4th minus 3 times 3 squared minus 4. Okay. So we have a, 3 to the 4th is 81, 3 cubed is 27, and then we're subtracting 4, 81 minus 27 minus 4 comes out to 81 minus 31, or 50a, okay? So if 50a equals 25, well, that means that a equals 1 half, right? And, and now that we've solved for this leading term, we can write our polynomial. p of x is 1 half times x to the fourth minus 3x squared minus 4. Or if you want to write it in our standard form, 1 half x to the fourth minus 3 over 2x squared minus 2. Our last topic for the day involves looking at complex zeros of polynomials with real coefficients. Okay, there turns out to be actually a really interesting thing that comes out of it. Okay, and that result, right, is called the conjugate zeros theorem. And you may actually have already noticed this. when we were looking at the um, zeros of, a, of certain polynomials, but this is what it says. Okay? It says if a polynomial p has real coefficients, right, which is most of the ones that we work with, and if a complex number z is a zero of p, well then z bar, its, its complex conjugate, is also a 
was 0 of p, okay? And we're not going to prove this directly, right? There's a really nice um, proof of this in the book, okay? But I want you to sort of think about what would happen if this weren't the case, right? Say you have a bunch of these zeros, right? Some of them are our complex numbers. When you multiply them together, if you don't have their conjugates, you're going to get complex coefficients for that, for that polynomial when you expand it out, right? Which is, you know, not exactly ideal, right? Because we said that our polynomial has real coefficients, so we arise at a contradiction, okay? Let's look at an example to sort of work this out. Let's find a polynomial of degree three. Let's call it P of X. That has integer coefficients and zeros x equals one half, I guess, and three minus i. One of the things to notice is just right off the bat, right, is that by our conjugate zeros theorem, we already know the third zero of p, right? We have p of x equals our leading coefficient a times x minus one half, times what? x minus 3 minus i. But we also need to have x minus 3 plus i because we need its conjugate. Okay, I'm going to regroup that um, com those complex terms. Okay, we can instead group them like this, right? x minus 3, now that one becomes a plus i times x minus 3 times a minus i, right? Now this term is the factored form of a difference of squares, right? So we get a times x minus 1 half. That's going to be x minus 3 squared minus i squared, right? Expanding these out, we have our a times x minus 1 half going to come out looks to me like x squared minus 6x plus 10, right? Where this guy gives you x squared minus 6x plus 9, and then this negative i squared gives you an extra 1. Multiplying these two guys together, right? We get a times what? We get x cubed is that to minus 13 over 2x squared plus 13x's and minus 5, okay? So we need a value of a such that this holds, right? We're looking for a polynomial with integer coefficients, and this guy is not an integer. So let's choose a equals 2. In fact, any even number um, a works, we're going to choose the smallest one for a equals 2. That's going to give us our final polynomial of 2x squared, or 2x cubed, minus 13x squared, plus 26x minus 10. Okay. One of the really nice um, fallouts of this conjugate zeros theorem is our last theorem of the week. I know it's been a theorem heavy week, um, but this theorem is called the linear and quadratic factors theorem. Okay, it's a bit of a mouthful. And it goes a little something like this. Okay, it says that every polynomial with real coefficients K 
can be factored into a product of linear and irreducible quadratic factors with real coefficients, right? So that means no matter your polynomial, throw in the ugliest real coefficients you want, you can always get it down to linear and irreducible quadratic factors, right? Where this term irreducible qu quadratic factors means that we couldn't factor it in the real numbers, right? Um, something like x squared minus 6x plus 10, that's an irreducible qu quadratic factor, right? Because if we were to factor it, we would need complex numbers, right? And the reason that this theorem holds, right, is that, okay, it's going to have a bunch of zeros, right? It has real coefficients. So it's complex zeros always have to come in pairs. Those give us our irreducible quadratic factors. And any real zeros, well, those can become linear factors, okay? We'll do one last example of this um, before we finish up our lecture for the day. Let's say P of X is X to the fourth plus two X squared minus eight, okay? We want to part A factor P of X into linear and irreducible quadratic factors with real coefficients and part B. Let's factor P completely um, into linear factors, right? So taking a look at part A, well, it would look to me like the way to go here would be u substitution, right? If we let u equal x squared, then we get u squared plus 2u minus 8, which is going to factor into u plus 4 and u minus 2, and my u is x squared, okay? One of these is reducible, one of them isn't. My x squared plus 4 is irreducible over the real numbers, okay? But my x, minus, or but my x squared minus 2 can factor into x minus the square root of 2 and x plus the square root of 2, and we are done, okay? And then for part b, right, we've already factored this guy into linear terms, so we just need to factor this guy. Well, we already factored him earlier today, so that's going to come out to x minus 2i, x plus 2i, and our previous factors, x minus the square root of 2, and x plus the square root of 2. And with that, that completes our study of um, the complex zeros of polynomials. Um, it's going to wrap up the instruction for this week. Uh, next week, we're going to sort of dive into um, looking at what happens when we create rational functions from dividing one polynomial by another and how we can graph things like that.